when Calm founded, you first hooked up with Kevin Ayres. Yeah. Uh, another uh, Canterbury alumni. Yeah. So that must have that must have been quite an eye opener, though. Yeah, it was very it was very um, fortuitous. That so the, 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 the day after, because uh, I'd met Kevin, I'd already also already met David Allen at this. Um, no, there was a meeting point we all had at the flat of someone called Lady June. Oh, right, and yes. Made a veil, and we. I used to hang out there a lot with various other Canterburyites. And uh, the day after I decided to stop car, and I got a call from Kevin saying, do you want to come and play with me for a bit? And I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because he, um, his previous band had lost their guitarist because he'd gone to make a solo album. And his name was Mike Oldfield. And the solo album became Tubular Bells. So. So, uh, yeah, I jumped into Kevin's band. I played a bit on his album, Banana Moor. And uh, then we went off, we did the UK tour and then a very long French tour. And it was during the course of that long French tour that firstly I met my longtime partner, Miquette Giridi. And secondly, I sort of like switched to Gong. Yeah. The process of osmosis. I just sort of actually drifted away from Kevin's orbit into the Gong orbit. It was an irresistible move, actually. So I mean, now Gong, uh, Gong were obviously known for um, they, you know they were a sort of a, a hippie collective living in France. Uh, almost, I guess it was almost like a commune, was it? But clearly a very creative sort of setup. Well, it was you know it was we were, it was kind of economic as well. It was it was. <laughs> The most economic way to keep the band together, all in one place, in a, in this uh, fantastic house in a wood with a great rehearsal room. I mean, it was a great it was a great situation for creativity, actually. And see? obviously with a communal living. I mean, there was used to get quite chaotic at times, and then there was times when we'd have to, you know, a lot of people would just turn up and end up staying, and we'd have to sort of ask them to leave, and it was. You know, you see pictures from that era. Of course, there were in, some in the book as well, um, and it, it, I mean, it just looks like well, it, a completely sort of another time. But it, it looks quite magical for me. The best period of Gong, and uh, we lost the house at the end of '73, sadly, and ended up moving the whole operation to England under the auspices of uh, Virgin Records. That was fine, you know, we kept the band going and we still kept, kept producing great stuff, but I felt we lost something when we left France. It was really special in France. I mean, obviously you've always had sort of your own sort of musical philosophy and, 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 and ideas for your music. This was very much David Allen's sort of thing. How, how easy was it to ta tap into ideas now that you look back and think, where on earth did this come from? Uh, I no, guess, I I guess living in a house like that. I had an immediate long. affinity with David, you know, philosophically and you know, on, on, not just on music. We, we, we felt it, uh, even when I first met him in, before I joined the band. And uh, he, uh, you know, he helped me develop my ideas. I freely, you know, I pay tribute to his influence. And uh, Fish Rising, my solo album I did, which is the beginning of my period after Gong, um, as I said, was a lot of the material was stuff I originally developed for Karl Mark II, but it was all modulated by the Gong experience so that it became something, something else. Do you think, I mean, obviously, you, you know, you're, you're very well known for your own unique guitar style and sound. Um, and obviously, you know, the first couple of records, you're finding your feet, but you can really hear sort of sonic traits that connect the gong stuff that you did to, you know, the, the solo work. Do you think that you really found your feet musically performing with gong? It definitely helped me progress to a high level and gave me a lot of confidence. You know, obviously my confidence was a bit low at the time when I broke up Khan, I wasn't feeling so good and, you know, 
six months later, it was like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, without sounding sort of, you know, conceited or anything, there were, there were quite a few periods we'd gone, we, we felt we were just sort of producing just the most amazing stuff, you know, like, the, <laughs> you know, we felt we, this, is, this is really the place to be, this is just fantastic. We'd, we were sort of throwing ideas about, and I'd, I'd, I woke, I, th I don't know if I'd been up all night, or I woke up really early one morning, and I just had this, this riff came in my head. I went, wow. And I, and I thought, I tried, to, don't forget it, don't forget it, don't forget it. And I tried writing it down in a sort of little hieroglyphs. And then I rushed to get my guitar, and I went, wow. And then I got, I found Mike Howlett, and I said, hey, listen to this, man, listen to this. It's amazing, isn't it? And he went, that's great. <laughs> and then we sort of rushed to the rehearsal place, which was, it was like actually in, this was in England. We had to drive about 30 miles to get there, or 20 miles to get there. And we plugged in and we started throwing this riff around and working the track out. And we really thought this, was, this is the greatest thing ever. <laughs> I still love it. Now, David left before you in Gong, and you kind of assumed control for a bit. Uh, didn't last too long. Um, you played on a bit of Shamal, I think, but um, not, yeah. not the whole thing. Obviously, everyone looks at that as the album where it shifted from the sort of David's you know, philosophical and musical vision to the more sort of jazz fusion thing that, that they would become known for uh, later on in, in the 70s. Um, I, I'm assuming that you know, once David had gone, you felt that you, know, it, you just didn't feel comfortable to sort of to, to lead lead Gong because it had been very so very much his. Unfortunately, when, the, when it went through some real problems at the end of '74, beginning of '75, I was away finishing Fish Rising, my solo album, which I saw very much as a sort of equivalent to David's earlier solo album, Banana Moon. It wasn't like me striking out on my own. I just thought it was a sort of you know, a good companion to what we were doing in Gong. Gong was still the main thing. But there's a, a lot of, um, they was having a lot of problems in the house and I wasn't there. And um, I was kind of feeling kind of impotent. I couldn't really resolve this thing. It was all starting to crack up and it was frustrating for me. And I was, I was sad when Tim Blake left. I was sad when David left. Um, Miquette and I resolved to sort of Keep, keep in there and make a go of it. But um, there was this sort of kind of pressure to move away from the, the fantasy and the psychedelia and go more into instrumental prowess. And uh, it wasn't very satisfactory for me, really. I mean, I love the fact that Gong had this jazzy element. I thought that was one of the things that made it unique, but I liked it has been part of all the other stuff. Focusing just on that wasn't, wasn't enough for me. So I, I came to the conclusion, well, I want to keep more psychedelic. I'm going to just sort of go off on my own and resume basically what I was doing before, but obviously enriched by the three fantastic years I'd had with Gong. Now, before you, your solo career took off, you also got the chance to perform with the guy that you replaced in Kevin Ayres' band. Um, the live, the live performance of Tubular Bells with Mike Oldfield. So, that must have been quite something. Yeah, well, the real, the real big one was the one at the Queen Elizabeth Hall in June, um, June of '73. And uh, I have to say, Richard Branson, I mean, for his credit, he really pushed the boat out on that because people weren't seeing that Mike's record as a big hit or anything. It was, it was seen as a nice, interesting record. But Richard really liked it. He was really believed in it with a passion and he put together this concert with various luminaries and he got me and Pierre Merlin, the drummer of Gong, involved. And, and uh, it was just it was just at the end of the concert when, it, when, it, when we actually got through it, including Viv Stanshall, who fought, fell asleep, had to be woken up to do his bit. But at the end, we suddenly thought, you know, and seeing the reaction of the people, we thought, wow, this, this thing's going to be massive. 
you know. So it was a real big event for that. And then we did the um, second one for the BBC a few months later. It was a bit more of a studious thing. The, the first concert was a bit more sort of celebratory. And then afterwards, the various orchestral concoctions came out. It's another Richard's um, uh, schemes and plans that Mike wasn't happy about playing with the orchestral thing, so I got drafted in to do some of the concerts in, instead of Mike. Did one at the Albert Hall and then some in Kelvin Hall in Scotland. And now, this was David Bedford, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. I enjoyed that. My, 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 my parents, particularly my mother, were absolutely totally chuffed me playing at the Albert Hall. I mean, yeah, I've been really lucky. And, and so the luckiest thing of all is that at no point in my artistic career has any record label said, you've got to do this. I've always, no, obviously I listen to what they have to say. I mean, I'm a reasonable person, but I've always done what came to me and followed my inspiration right up to what I'm doing now. And I, I feel that's, that's the thing I'm most lucky with. So you were still in Gong and you'd got the solo deal. Well, actually, the solo deal was floated to me before, even before I joined Kevin Ayers. Right. It was, I did have a meeting with, uh, I think I met Richard and Simon Draper at, at the, in the time when we were congregating at Lady June's in 72. And at the time I said, well, not quite ready for it yet, but when I am, I'll let you know. And when we got into 74, I said, OK, I'd like to do it now. Are you still up for it? And they said yes. And that's how that happened. It certainly wouldn't happen today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was very lucky there. Everything, you know, it just all seemed to sort of flow nicely, you know. I mean, you know, I've, you know, it hasn't all been sort of bed of roses. I have my own struggles and my own difficulties. You know, it's not all, it's not all easy, but I have had some good fortune. Uh, Fish Rising went a long way to sort of set, establishing you as Steve Hillage in your own right. You must have been very happy with the way things went with, with the first solo album. Yeah, well, it, you know, it, it gave me a sort of platform to build on from when I decided I, I couldn't stay, stay with Gong. So, yeah, I mean, it was, I wasn't thinking in terms of some master plan. I just wanted to make a nice record, you know. And... By L, of course, you're working with Utopia, Todd Rundgren's. Yeah. And in studio. What was what was that like? Well, that was another. That was another quite fortuitous development. It was because um, I was already quite keen on Todd Runger, and I've been I'd actually seen him live. And some of my friends were real fans of him, including Chris Cutler of Henry Cow, right. who I shared a flat with in London for a while. And uh, he was a big Todd Runger fan, believe it or not. But some people might not realise that. And um, and then I'd left uh, I'd left Gong, and I was wasn't quite sure how we were going to go. And then I got a call from Simon Draper, Virgin Record. He said, uh, "Steve, you, are you into Todd Runger?" I said, "Yeah." He said, "Well, he's he's expressed interest in producing you." I said, "You're joking?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so we did it. You know, it was it was great. I went over to America, and, and part of the part of the whole plan was we'd we'd work with his band at his studio, and just sort of we went over there and we did it. Now, um, how did you find working with Todd? Some people um, have, have found him slightly difficult to work with. He's he's the sort of producer. He's got his sound, and if you make a record with him, it will be. Completely imbued with his sound, and that's that's. What, I mean, that's the deal. I mean, it, well, I knew that before beforehand, but um, yeah, we had a few, you know, creative differences. Uh, but you know, I, I left with a good respect of him, and I think he had a good respect for me. You know, I met him various occasions later, and in fact, it was even in nineteen. 81, there was a discussion of me doing another album produced by him. And, um, but 
that didn't work out because he wanted me to make demos first. And because I was in the middle of producing, just about to start producing Sinful Minds, I just said, well, <laughs> I can't, man. He said, well, you know, don't really want to do it without demos. So anyway, but it was, you know, we got on well, you know. I mean, L doesn't sound like a Todd Rundgren record. It sounds like a Steve Hillage record. So yeah, in, in, yeah but it, still, in, it still doesn't sound like any of the other records. It's still got his sound, his drum sound. Right. You can hear his way the vocals are. Motivation Rodeo came next, and, and that was notable because the material was slightly shorter. That was, that was kind of a big switch. It was a big switch. It's quite a long story how we, how we got into that, but it was... Um, we got into a kind of roller coaster ride with the, because L was quite successful. And, uh, but at the same time, I was, um, I developed a strong friendship with um, a gentleman called Tony Andrews, who is a building, a PA, a sound system builder. And he's now very celebrated because he run, his, his company's called Function One, a very big company. Now, before that, he had a company called Turbo Sound. And uh, I used to go down to his place in um, Surrey, where there was a rehearsal studio, and he's bit really into funk. And we used to have these parties where he set up these systems and have a party with funk records, like a sort of like a, a pre-rave rave. And so I was getting into sort of funk quite a lot. And then we did an American tour with um, uh, promoting the L album. And I was getting fans coming to see me uh, after this show. And they were saying, um, you know, what kind of music are you into, Steve? Are you into Van Gogh, Generator, King Crimson? They had me very much pigeonholed in a progressive rock thing. And I said, yeah, yeah, I like Van Gogh. I love, love King Crimson. But I'm also really into funk. I like Parliament Bootsy's rubber band. And they'd go, Steve, you like disco? I said, yeah, well, what's the problem? What's the problem? And this had a kind of an effect on me. I said, well, do I really want to be like just purely pigeonholed into a particular area? I mean, if, I'm li if I like a certain type of music and it influences me, I'd like to sort of to do it. And then um, a bit later on that tour, um, we met Malcolm Cecil, who was also someone I was already a fan of because of his... Um, early synthesizer record with Tonto's expanding headband. And, uh, you know, and um, he's also achieved quite a lot of fame by producing Stevie Wonder using the Tonto synthesizer. And we thought it'd be a great idea for him to produce an album where we could bring a, a bit of a funk element into it and also develop the electronics. And that's how Motivation Radio came about. For me, that's one of the best albums I did because it, it, it was just, it was just, I don't know, just purely coming from me. It was just what I wanted to do. Wasn't quite what the record company wanted, but it didn't matter, you know. Uh, Green was next. That's my personal favourite album of yours. Um, you worked with Nick Mason from Pink Floyd. We produced that. Pardon? Nick Mason from Pink Floyd produced. Yeah, Nick. Nick. Did the, um, how did you find working with Nick? Uh, I love working with Nick. It was fantastic. Um, he's a very uh, genial fellow, and uh, you know, picked up quite a lot of trade secrets of how, how the Pink Floyd worked. And um, but I was, again, I was, I was very quite blessed by having. Um, the experience of being produced by three very different but very um, notable producers as Todd Runger and Malcolm Sess and Nick Mason and, and I've always felt that, that held me, that gave me a very good grounding for when I became a producer myself. Mm -hmm.